Okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone this enormous crowd to the Center for Marxist Education. We're going to be talking about uh, Louis Althusser and uh, the title. Um, but before I start, I'm Doug uh, Ina Green. I'm a volunteer here at the CME. I open Mondays generally 4 to 8. I also give the monthly Red History Lecture Series. The next month is not which is generally on unknown, obscure figures, events, movements. And next month, you may think on the surface, he's not actually unknown, he's Gramsci. But rather, I think Gramsci is incredibly, incredibly misunderstood, misinterpreted, to justify all kinds of horrendous politics that he would um, be revolted at. I'm also the author of a forthcoming book from Haymarket, books on Louis August Blanqui, which will be available next year. And this talk on Althusser, who I was initially very reluctant to write it. I did write it. And it's a lot different than a, an essay that was published. Um, I got criticisms back from it, some of which I think were fair, uh, that I came off as dismissing Althusser, and which was not my intention. But I can definitely see why that was so. I certainly want to be remembered for that. So this is a slightly, if you read the, yes, the published version, this is a little different from it. I'm essentially looking at, well, for, to start off, I will be talking about the Cultural Revolution, but I'm, I'm actually not here to give a verdict at all on the Cultural Revolution. I'm certain that among the people watching, among the audience here, that there are very divergent views on the Cultural Revolution, everything from 10 years of disaster, bureaucratic infighting, to the closest advance to communism we've ever seen. I'm more looking at what Althusser got out of looking at the Cultural Revolution, which is actually a very different thing than a historical verdict on the Cultural Revolution, which I actually don't want to give. Um, but anyway, the Cultural Revolution, along with um, the split between the Soviet Union and China, following various tensions between them, and um, Khrushchev's secret speech, it did lead to contention within the international communist movement, including, which rippled all the way to France, where Louis Althusser was. And he was a loyal member of the French Communist Party. So, let's start. Louis, uh, Althusser had joined the Communist Party, the PCF, in 1948, which was then one of the largest communist parties in Europe, with roughly a quarter of the electorate having gained prestige for its role in the resistance. The PCF had also played a less than heroic role during French colonial wars in Indochina and Algeria, revealing the limits of their anti-imperialism. And following Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech in 1956, which denounced Stalin and the cult of personality, caused a major shakeup in the PCF. Initially, the, f the leadership of the French party balked at, balked at the new line, but eventually came around to accepting it. At various times, it actually said the alleged speech of Nikita Khrushchev. The new Soviet line promoted a line of peaceful coexistence between East and West and the possibility of a peaceful transition to socialism, which is soon adapted by the French. According to Gregory Elliott in a study of Al Qusera, the PCF adjustment to the Khrushchevite line arose not simply from fidelity to the bastion of world socialism, but because there was an underlying compatibility between the imperatives of internationalism and domestic horizons. Regardless of its official doctrine, the PCF had, in a sense, been pursuing an analogous line in implacably French colors ever since the popular front, which had occurred in the 30s. Philosophically, the new line in the international communist movement was being promoted using the language of humanism and returned to Hegel and the works of the young Marx with their, with their emphasis on alienation. Humanism was being used by both the Soviets and the PCF to do a right-wing, revisionist, and social democratic line. The promotion of socialist humanism would be one of the battering rams that pro-Soviet parties would use against China following the split in the international communist movement. Humanism would also be one of the targets of Althusser's work. However, Althusser penned a great deal of his criticism of humanism and the PCF in oblique language so as not to openly challenge the party. When the Cultural Revolution occurred in 1956, Althusser penned an anonymously anonymous article on its impact for one of the new Maoist groups in France. Althusser hailed the Cultural Revolution as, and he's, I quote, not, first of all, an argument, 
It is, and foremost, an historical fact. It is one fact among others. It is an unprecedented fact. The fact proven by the Cultural Revolution, in line with the claim that different levels of society develop unevenly, that Marx, Engels, and Lenin always proclaimed it was absolutely necessary to give the socialist infrastructure established by the polit a political revolution a corresponding, that is, socialist ideological superstructure. For this to occur, an ideological revolution is necessary, a revolution in the ideology of the masses. Well, a socialist revolution took over the means of production and establish a base in nationalized industry, this did not mean that a socialist superstructure would naturally follow. To believe this was to fall into economism. Rather, the Cultural Revolution showed, and I quote, in, a, in socialist countries after the more or less complete socialist transformation of the property of the means of production, there's still uh, this question that still remains, what road is to be taken? Is it necessary to go all the way to the end of the socialist revolution and gradually pass over into communism? Or to the contrary, stop halfway and go backwards toward capitalism? This question is being posed to us in a particularly acute manner." End quote. Socialism was thus, for, uh, as Elvisar interpreted, not a forward march. Rather, its development in conditions of capitalist encirclement and the development of internal contradictions opened up two rows, one that continued towards communism and another back toward capitalism. Along with economic and political revolutions which have established socialism, uh, Althusser says, the Chinese Communist Party declares that in order to reinforce and develop socialism in China, in order to assure its future and protect it in a lasting way from every risk of regression, it must add a third revolution to the prior political and economic revolutions, a mass ideological revolution. The Cultural Revolution's ultimate aim is to transform the ideology of the masses, to replace the feudal, bourgeois, and petty bourgeois ideology that still permeates the masses of Chinese society with a new ideology of the masses, proletarian and socialist. And in this way, give the socialist economic infrastructure and political superstructure a corresponding ideological superstructure. In other words, by overthrowing those in the party taking the capitalist road, the masses would transform the superstructure, which in turn could influence the base and continue on the road to, to communism. The reason for the primacy of ideology in China's Cultural Revolution was not, a, was not to just attack a few bad eggs in the party or wayward intellectuals, but to transform the ideology of the masses for struggle. And Althusser says, now such a transformation of the idea of ideology of the masses can only be the work of the masses themselves acting in and through organizations that are mass organizations. The important role of ideology in the Cultural Revolution essay by Althusser is something that he would emphasize again with at more theoretical rigor with the ideology, ideological state apparatuses in, in his On Reproduction of Capitalism. And echoes of that position uh, can actually be seen in this earlier work. When Althusser notes that during the Cultural Revolution that it is young people, particularly students who are in the vanguard, he notes the importance of education in reproducing the dominant ideology. On the one hand, he says, the teaching system in place for the education of youth, we should not forget that school deeply marks men even during periods of historical mutation, was in China a bastion of bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology. On the other hand, the youth, which has not experienced revolutionary struggles and wars, constitutes, in a socialist country, a very delicate matter, a place where the future is in large part played out. The youth is not revolutionary solely by the fact of being born in a socialist country, nor from growing up hearing stories of the exploits of its elders. If, despite all the energies of its age, it finds itself due to historical failings, abandoned to the ideological disarray or void, it is not then given over to spontaneous ideological forms that ceaselessly fill in this void bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideologies, whether inherited from its own national past or imported from without. These forms find their natural points of support in the positivism, empiricism, and apolitical protectivism of scholars and other specialists. In return, if a socialist country assigns its youth a great revolutionary task, and if it educates them for this action, not only will the youth contribute in the cultural revolution to the transformation of the existing ideology, it will educate itself and transform its own ideology. It's on the, it is on the youth that ideology of whatever sort has the most impact. 
doesn't currently look end quote. This attack on bourgeois survival in the superstructure thus opens the road to greater revolutionization of the dominant ideology and a way to continue the forward motion of the revolution. It is in the ideological class struggle that the fate or progress of a socialist or progression of a socialist country is played out. Althusser also upholds the Chinese concept of regression back to capitalism because Marxism is not an evolutionary or economistic philosophy. However, evolutionary forms of Marxism cannot recognize this because they don't understand it, to, according to Althusser. The historical dialectic allows for lags, distortions, regressions without repetition, leaps, etc. Althusser also attacks evolutionary Marxism who deny the role of the primacy of ideology and for their limited definition of class. And Althusser's uh, elaboration of social class is actually worth quoting at length. And he says, a social class is not defined, in fact, solely by the position of its members in the relations of production, and therefore by the relations of production. It is also defined at the same time by their position in political and ideological relations, which remain class relations long after the socialist transformation of the relations of production. There is no doubt that the economic, the relations of production, defines a social class in the last instance. But class struggle constitutes a system and is at work at different levels, economic, political, ideological. The transformation of one level does not make the forms of class struggle at the other levels disappear. In this way, class struggle can continue quite virulently at the political level, and above all, the ideological level. Long after the more or less complete suppression of the economic basis of the property owning classes in a socialist country, it is then essentially in relation to the forms of political and especially ideological class struggle that social classes are defined, depending on the side they take in political and ideological struggles. In fact, Althusser's attack on economistic forms of socialism in his Cultural Revolution essay forms the basis of his criticism of Stalin and the Stalinian devi deviation, as he called it. Uh, what Althusser, like Maoists, generally up upheld Stalin's contribution in building socialism in one country, industrializing the Soviet Union and defeating the Nazis, and transmitting Marxism Lenin to millions of communists, albeit in a rather dogmatic form. It also there also claims that Stalin or the Stalinian deviation was a form of economism that had afflicted the communist movement since the 1930s and according to him was the posthumous revenge of the Second International as a revival of its main tendency, that being economist. For Althusser, I'm sorry, for Stalin and the Soviet Union, according to him, from 1930 through 32 at the least, was characterized by the consistent politics of the primacy of the productive forces over the relations of production. This affected the whole of Soviet politics that developed during this period, planning in relation to the peasantry, the role of the party, promotion of breakneck, industrialization. Now, while Althusser believed this was perhaps necessary and unavoidable, due to the capitalist encirclement of the Soviet Union, it did not it did have horrifying consequences, such as the purges of the 1930s. And on the theoretical level, the Stalinian deviation encouraged economic evolutionism in pedagogical texts such as uh, dialectical materialism and historical materialism, and uh, according to which Althusser says, the conjuring away of the historical role of Trotsky and others in the Bolshevik Revolution, the thesis of the sharpening the class struggle under social the formula, everything depends on cadres, etc among ourselves, the thesis of bourgeois science, proletariat science, the thesis of absolute pauperization. These would be some of Althusser's criticisms of Stalin's uh, text. So far from promoting a return to the politics of Stalin, which Althusser is actually uh, accused of doing, he believed that a Marxist critique of it was necessary in both theory and practice. And Althusser argued that the secret speech of Khrushchev was not actually a left-wing critique of Stalin, but a rightist one since it attributed all of Stalin's errors to the cult of personality and did not uncover the deeper issues which had caused the deviation. And he says, now this pseudo-concept, the circumstances of whose solemn 
and dramatic pronouncement are well known, you talk about the cult of personality, did indeed expose certain practices of abuses, errors, and certain cases crimes, but explained nothing of their conditions, of their causes, in short of their, inter of their internal, internal determination and therefore of their forms. Yet since it claimed to explain what in fact it did not explain, this pseudo-concept could only mislead those whom it was supposed to instruct. Must we be even more explicit? To reduce the grave events of 30 years of Soviet and communist history to the pseudo-explanation by the cult was not and could not have been a simple mistake, an oversight of, of an intellectual hostile hostility to the practice of divine worship. It was, as we know, a political act of responsible leaders a certain one-sided way of putting forward the problems not of what is vulgarly called Stalinism, but what, I, but what must, I think, be called by the name of the concept provisionally the Stalinian deviation. Well, and, end quote. Well, it was necessary in contrast, according to Althusser, to look at the contradictions of socialism that have produced it. Whereas the secret speech just looked at the defects of the legal apparatus, um, it neglected to look at the role of the ideological state apparatuses more below, the repressive state apparatuses, and the existing relations of production, the class struggle, etc. In other words, only external and surface phenomena were analyzed, not the deeper internal causes which are, ne are necessary for a Marxist critique of Stalin. Or in this and the Soviet experience. However, since the secret speech did not do that, it was, according to Althusser, a right-wing critique of Stalin and had inevitable ideological effects, encouraging humanism, bourgeois forms of thought in the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, and allied communist parties. According to Althusser, communists were following the social democrats and even religious thinkers who used to have almost a guaranteed monopoly on these things in the practice of exploiting the works of Marx's youth in order to draw out of them the ideology of man, liberty, alienation, transcendence, etc. Without asking whether the system of these notions was idealist or materialist, whether this ideology was pretty bourgeois or proletariat, end quote. And it, for him, this was a step backward for Marxists and communists around the world. And again, he says uh, what's needed is a left-wing critique of Stalin, the Soviet Union, and the practice of various communist parties. And this was something that the Cultural Revolution, or the Chinese Revolution, and especially the Cultural Revolution, did in practice. And what Althusser was trying to do in theory. Althusser summed up the Chinese as offering, and I quote, a silent critique, which speaks through its actions, the result of the, of the political and ideological struggles of the revolution from the long march to the cultural revolution and its effects. A critique from afar, a critique from behind the scenes, to be looked at more closely to be interpreted. A contradictory critique, moreover, if only because of the disproportion between acts and texts. Whether you like it, but a critique from which one can learn and which can help us to test our hypotheses, that is to help us see our own history more clearly, but here too, of, of course, we have to speak in terms of a tendency and of specific forms without letting the forms mask the tendency and its contradictions. The Cultural Revolution, according to Althusser, had and the Chinese Revolution as well, had provided in both theory and practice a repudiation of the economism, the primacy of the productive forces, humanism, evolutionism, and rightism that had characterized Soviet Marxism. And we have made brief discussion, uh, uh, mention of the importance of ideology during the uh, Cultural Revolution. However, let us now discuss how he saw I ideology operating under capitalism. While there is no direct relation from uh, Althusser's understanding of the Cultural Revolution and his ide views on ideology under capitalism, it is still worth discussing in its own right. Althusser's I idea of the ideological state apparatus, or henceforth the ISA, were written about most clearly in 1969 in response to the French student strikes of the previous year. There he discussed his modes of production and their, with their four theses. The dominance of one for, mode of production in a society. Two, the unity between the relations and forces of production. Three, in order for the productive forces to be reproduced, able to be reproduced, this needs to be done within the relations of production. Four, that the economic base is determinant in the last instance. However, in line with his early work, 
Althusser emphasized that a mode of production was made up of complex and interacting practices existing in unity. Althusser also highlights the importance of this understanding not, only, uh, understanding not only for capitalism but for socialist revolution. And he says, the mode of production of a class society is quite the opposite of a mere technical process of production. At the same time as it is a locus of production, it is a locus of class exploitation and of class struggle as well. It is in the productive process of the mode of production itself that the knot of class relations and the class struggle bound up with exploitation is time. This class struggle pits the proletarian class struggle against the capitalist class struggle. It is easy to understand the capitalist interest in depicting the process of production as the opposite of what it is, as a purely technical rather than an exploitive process. It is easy, also easy to understand that the destiny of every class struggle, the victorious revolutionary class struggle included, ultimately depends on an accurate conception of the relations of production. To build socialism, it will be necessary to establish new relations of production that abolish concretely the exploitive effects of the previous relations of production together with their class effects. The construction of socialism can therefore not be settled with purely legal formulas, ownership of the means of production plus better technical organization of the labor process, end quote. Althusser is concerned in this work with how capitalism is reproduced. Of paramount importance to the reproduction of capitalism is the role of ideology, which Althusser believes are not mistaken ideas or false consciousness, but exist in definite material practices. And he says, ideology does not exist in the world of ideas conceived as spirit, a spiritual world. Ideology exists in institutions and practices specific to them. We are even tempted to say more precisely, ideology exists in apparatuses and the practices specific to them. Ideology exists through the ISA apparatuses, or the ISAs, which although private, whether it's churches, schools, families, etc., they reinforce the rule of the bourgeoisie through ideology. And it's through the ISAs that capitalist society is reproduced, not in the factory, primarily. And he says, now, however, we are entering a domain in which observing what goes on in the enterprise is, if not totally blind, then very nearly so, and for good reason. The reproduction of labor power takes place essentially outside the enterprise or the factory, end quote. And according to Althusser, following the Cultural Revolution in May 1968, the one ideological state apparatus certainly has the dominant role, although hardly anyone lends a, an ear to its music. It is so silent, this is the school for education, end quote. Ide ideology in this conception becomes a lived practice, producing people as subjects who obey the law, do their civic duty, shaping our beliefs in line with the social institutions we are born and we live within. Contrary to some critics, Althusser does, does not believe that the role of the ISAs denies human agency. Rather, the ISAs are necessary not only because of the rule of because the rule of the bourgeoisie cannot be secured only by force, but due to the constant class struggle. And he says, just as the class struggle never ceases, so the dominant class combat to unify existing ideological elements and forms never ceases. This amounts to saying that the dominant ideology can never completely resolve its own contradictions, which are a reflection of the class struggle, although its function is to resolve them. Just as there is conflict in the workplace, Althusser argues, that there's also struggle within ideology, which is contested by class struggle. And that imposes specific demands on the communist movement in dealing with the bourgeois, which was he, and their ideology. The working class great strategic demand for autonomy reflects this condition, subjected to the domination of the bourgeois state and the effect of intimidation and self-evidence. Self-evidence of the dominant ideology, the working class can win its autonomy only on condition that it free itself from the dominant ideology, that demarcate itself from it in order to endow itself with the forms of organization and action that realize its own ideology, proletarian ideology. Characteristic of this break, this radical distance taken, is the fact that it can be achieved only by a protracted struggle, which must take the forms of bourgeois domination into account and combat the bourgeoisie within its own forms of domination, but without ever being taken in by the game represented by these forms, which are not simple neutral forms, but apparatuses that realize the existence of the dominant ideology. And in conclusion, which I'm, I wanted to open this talk for more discussion, this 
opposed to lecture. In the Chinese Revolution in general, and the Cultural Revolution in particular, Althusser saw in theory and practice a repudiation of economism, humanism, and dogmatism of various vulgar Marxisms. To Althusser, the Cultural Revolution showed the importance of ideology under socialism, which needed to be transformed along with the rest of the superstructure to continue uh, onto, onto communism. And furthermore, that the vital role of ideology was something that Althusser highlighted in his uh, writings on how capitalism was uh, functioned and was reproduced. Thank you. So we can talk. Again, this was short, and I made no attempt whatsoever to be comprehensive on Althusser. So feel free to respond to me to bring up stuff I intentionally left out. Critiques, polemics are welcome. I also want to say, if you're not signed up for the CME mailing list, we have it right here. And if you want to help us stay in business, or against business, I think it would be more appropriate in this case, uh, you can put in a few bucks, so just pass that around. So yeah, let's open it up. I know this was rather short, but... <laughs> So in Althusser's opinion, the Cultural Revolution was a left-wing critique of Stalinism, as opposed to the was a right-wing Yeah. Um, I guess, could you elaborate on how it was a left-wing critique? I'm not as familiar with the Cultural Revolution as... I mean, the way he's saying it is, like, the Soviet, like, what he's saying about the Soviet Union is essentially that... The Soviet Union had developed in such a way that they put the primacy on industrialization, you know, catching up with the West, catching up with the, the advanced capitalist countries. So they develop, you know, the first planned economy with whatever contradictions and shortcomings may have existed. But in his mind, that they had not really changed the political and ideological structures. And they'd also not really dealt with contradictions among the people. You know, this manifests itself in things like the purges. So, you know, throughout the 30s especially, you see various conservatism coming back into the Soviet Union. You know, there's a promotion of Russian nationalism, the rights of, you know, abortion is outlawed and stuff like that. So there had not been a corresponding development of socialist ideology, a corresponding development in the political superstructures. Because, um, especially if you read Stalin, like it comes out very clearly in Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism, if you change the economic base, it follows that the political and the superstructures will change correspondingly. And that's a very economistic way to look at it. Whereas Althusser is saying the Chinese Revolution, which is, and there have been various left-wing critiques of Stalin and the Soviet Union going all the way back to 1917, pretty much. He's saying in practice, the Chinese Revolution, especially in the Cultural Revolution, is showing they're trying to change the ideology, change the political practices. And, you know, there have been various experiments in China with new forms of factory owner uh, management, new ways to, you know, bring the masses into the educational structure, into the polit like new the three-in-one committees that had sprouted up these new mass organizations. And he's saying because that they were doing that, they were ch also challenging old ideas, you know, left over from China's past, along with inherited from the Soviet experience, that this challenge to political and ideology, revolutionizing them, would in turn affect the economic base, you know, and allow them to continue the forward march. I mean, one of the slogans, I'm not sure if it's actually a cultural revolution slogan, was grass revolution, promote production. And you can kind of see, if you, if you, you know, read out this air and like a lot of this stuff on the cultural revolution, why that was so. Because if the masses are, you know, changing like the very forms of like factory ownership and stuff, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be reproducing capitalist social relations or old social relations, new ones, and this would increase production. Okay, that makes sense. That's a very, that, that may be wrong, but you know, that's no, my I, interpretation. I, I it that's my interpretation. Okay. Anything else? Again, I left out a lot, Jay. I was hoping for a big crowd to discuss. That's okay. So.
how far did he get with the team and still the had uh, I mean backing management. I mean, Sully's brought in a lot of Western concepts on Taylor's. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it comes Sully. up throughout various of his works. Like, uh, it is in On the Reproduction of Capitalism, you can find it. Like, but it's not like, he's not like writing a historical study of like how this happened. You know, this is not, it's not a work of history. He's a philosopher trying to look at that, especially how it's coming out, at least as he perceives it in practice in the Cultural Revolution. And there's actually a very interesting quote. I didn't include it in this, but it was a footnote. It's not by Althusser, but it's by the French economist, uh, who's a comrade of, of uh, Althusser, he's also a Marxist named Charles Bellheim. And he's arguing with Ernest Mendel, who's a Trotskyist. Now both, uh, now I'm actually a big fan of both these men, but this is what uh, Mendel says about, I'm sorry, Bettelheim says about Mendel's criticism of, uh, of, of socialism, of, of socialist transition. What Mendel actually tries to do is to do is from the most abstract categories relating to socialist society, the more concrete economic categories that characterize the society or the transitional societies, together with the practical laws that govern the working of these societies. By so doing, he fails to follow the road that leads from the most general theoretical abstractions to the concrete in thought. In order to transverse this road, one needs a to go outside the simple relations of formal logic, deduction, and reduction, and use the methods of dialectical synthesis. It is, in fact, impossible to recreate the concrete by merely adding abstractions together. It has to be reproduced by means of dialectics, which is indeed the way in which one gains access to reality. In order to reach reality in this way, one has to proceed by mediation, by reconstituting in concept the organic totality of socio-economic formation, Something that can only be done by taking account of all the factors that make up this totality, including, of course, the factors of practice, beginning with economic practice itself. And this is true also when one is trying to construct the theory of socialist economy to operate with the most meager of concepts, the only ones that could be worked out before there had been any social practice in the building of socialism. At the same time, he rejects as impure and unworthy of being accorded any theoretical value. The concepts which it has been possible to work out since then as a result of social practice in the building of socialism. As often happens, the positivist approach that is the mechanical contrasting of the dead reality which an equally dead abstraction becomes transformed into a kind of idealism which renounces all approaches to reality through practice. What am I my interpretation of what Bettelheim is saying to Mendel is Bettelheim is saying, listen, you're looking at this very abstractly. You're not looking at what have been these concrete practices of transitional societies in China, Cuba, etc. And you're trying to deduce from stuff that had been developed before there had really even been any attempt at this, what socialism would look like, as opposed to looking at the concrete practices that had developed. And Bellheim, he actually does write his own history of um, the Soviet experience. That is, uh, and uh, at least two volumes are like actually freely available online. And so he is borrowing a lot from Althusser in doing so. I, I'm not quite sure if I would call him an Althusser, but he certainly, you know, they're operating around the same time they interact with one another. But Althusser, again, he does not write a history of the Soviet experience or anything like that. But he is trying to look out, in his mind, again, how the Chinese Revolution, in a certain sense, provides this critique, a living critique, in his mind, of the Soviet experience. Whether that's right or wrong is up to you to decide, but I'm just trying to get at what he's trying to do. I would think, especially based on, like, Bettelheim as well, like, that he would be critical, he was critical of things like Taylorism, you know, reproducing that. And again, it's also, and I think something to keep in mind is, like, this critique could only come, essentially, after there had been the experience. Like, before 1917, no one really, you could guess what it would look like, but it had never been done before. So the Soviets, they had the honor and the, pro and the uh, 
contradictions of being first and doing all kinds of stuff that the Chinese in their revolution, some of which they reproduced, some of which they didn't. In a certain sense, it, that could be construed as a living critique, as opposed to like all kinds of theorists who were writing of this, but they were just looking at concepts that had been developed before 1917, as opposed to these living critiques, like in China or wherever else.
what I see, I've always seen as kind of like a consistent core of Marxism is kind of what, what like Marx's original engagement with Hegel about the idea of the supremacy of materialism or idealism, like what drives history. And, and you did mention in your lecture this is kind of, what I see is kind of like another way of saying that is this idea of a superstructure and a substructure. And the idea that to have a, a really meaningful, thorough revolution, you need to get to this, the, the substructure and, and it's like it's like the ground upon which everything else floats, and, and, and it seems as, as Marxism develops, Althusser and and others, um, Gramsci and, and you know start to kind of deconstruct this as saying, well, it's not really so. It's such a simple one direction kind of relationship that in fact think what we would consider superstructure is like ideology actually can going backwards and affect what we would traditionally call oh, yeah. the superstructure. So then, the, then to me that kind of, that draws into question this whole cause and effect relationship and the, the, you know, discussion about, you know, um, I guess the very core of that, you know, premise of, of the importance of materialism. Um, but on the, other, and then on the opposite extreme, I think it's become very popular on the left to kind of go into it. I, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't have all the citations to say, to say whether these are related or not, but this kind of like postmodern perspective where it almost, the material doesn't matter and it's like whatever you call it, it will come and we can change society just by changing our language or very, very ideal, you know, very what I call idealist. Postmodern, postmodern idea. Reality lies somewhere in between these two these two perspectives, but I, I, I haven't really. I'm, I'm curious to, to learn more, I guess, about this branch of Marxism because it engages the, those ideas. But it seems like there it seems like there, there's ideologies very important to to how society reproduces itself and changing society. But you can't just change. You can't use ideological fiat. In any case. Yeah. Any more than material. I'm gonna, this may or may not be related to what you're saying, but it's like, it, this is what actually made Althusser's idea on the ISAs make sense to me. And if one day... Can you explain how he gets that ideological state apparatus, like where is that? It's, you know, are you, I mean, it's in the book Reproducing, on Reproducing Capitalism, which is it's re, finally republic, it published in a full English translation last year, or the year before. We actually have it for sale here. Um, just one copy, but um, so he kind of goes into this in much detail. You can also find like the short one essay on this online. But it's again, like you're saying, ideology is a lived practice, and it came clearly to me when I was watching an episode of Law and Order. Yes, I watch Law and Order. I, I have no problem admitting that. And in the episode, the prosecutors were getting. They were like really mad because there was this one who was either a lawyer or a judge who was not essentially, he's corrupt. You know, he was uh, you know, taking bribes, you know, or you know, his uh, secretary was just not, was, you know, kind of rigging the system. And they did not like this. They wanted this guy removed because it's not upholding the integrity of the justice system. So they are essentially, these lawyers were trying to live out the practice, the ideology of what they perceived, you know, the justice system to be. They wanted it to be that, so that, that they want to get this corrupt guy out. So you could see in those lawyers that they're living out the ideology of the justice system. And again, there are of course contradictions among it that Alasair recognizes, but it's it's kind of so it is like this material practice. And you know, he thinks like various forms of false consciousness or idealistic and so on, and that's you know so it's because it's it's lived, you know. If you go if you go to church, as he would say, and you pray, you do the rosary, you do all the rites, you're essentially living the practice of Catholicism or Protestantism or whatever. And this is a, and in many respects, this has not been done by a lot of Marxists. Gramsci had kind of done something like this with the genome and you know, civil society, but his ideas were not really actually as well known as they would be at the time Althusser was writing. Althusser draws upon Gramsci. Arguably, the ISAs come out of that, too. Arguably, I mean. Also, Yeah. 
actually were to go back to say Frank with the Enlightenment and a lot of rationalists, they would say that people are tricked, they're duped by priests or whomever. And that's not to say priests don't do but trick people, they certainly do. But to explain like how those ideas are in people by that, it's very idealistic. It's not materialist. So he is in a sense trying, in my view, trying to come up with a materialist view of ideology. And it's worth interrogating. I mean, again, like I said, before I think the full essay was published, you could kind of say that he's denying the role of human agency, which is my big objection to a lot of it. He's trying, and, but he does kind of deal with it in the full version. Which, you know, I, I, I would never try and deny human agency. I'm not deterministic in that sense. But. I don't know if that quite addresses your question, or? Well, that's, that's part of what I'm thinking. Yeah. A lot of his stuff is online, for those of you who don't know, Marxist.org, Marx to Mao, a lot of this stuff. Any other comments, concerns, objections, polemics on anything? We got to the, this critique of humanism, it was much better, was it a, you know, reflecting debate within the PCF, yeah. but in the general French intellectual scene, you know, were people both Marxists and non-Marxists who at the time were pursuing critiques of humanism, some like Arthur say doing it from a Marxist perspective, and other people were doing it, say, from a like Heideggerian perspective, or various other perspectives. I don't know, there were various forms of structuralism that were popular in the 60s. Some of them were Marxists, some weren't. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this before, but, um, you know, someone like Roger Garundi, I'm probably saying his name wrong, but um, he had, before 1956, he'd been a dogmatic upholder of the Communist Party line. And then after 1956, he comes around to all this humanism, Marxist Christian dialogue, which Althusser sees as like, you know, moving away from class struggle and promoting explicitly an ideology. Well, Garundi actually. He actually became religious. Yes, he eventually becomes religious. But Even then when he was still in the PCF, yeah. I think he became a Catholic. He converted to Catholicism while he was still in the PCF. Now he's, didn't he become a Muslim? Yeah, that was and eventually. Yeah, eventually became a Muslim. About ten years after. Yeah, but so he and part of Althusser, like you know, he sees like with humanism, he's like it's drawing a lot upon the works of the young Marx, like the 1844 manuscripts and stuff on alienation. Well, in France. Which is the first people that write on the early stuff were priests. <laughs> yeah, priests. Which yeah, were priests, and he, you know he says that, and he does not, of course, like Sartre and existentialism because I think Sartre uh, would call himself a uh, humanist yeah. in respect, and so he wants to you know make sure that you know you have a Marxism that you know has class struggle up front that is promoting a revolutionary practice. And so he's he's criticizing all these humanists, Marxists, non-Marxists. Sometimes he does it very unfairly with people like Lukács, in my view. Um, but he, he does see it used explicitly to promote this non-revolutionary politics, in his view. And of course, so he's he's saying that there's a break between the young and the old Marx. Essentially, I'm going to bastardize it, but young Marx is more ideological. You know, he's still steeped in Hegelianism. Whereas the young, older Marx is scientific, you know, the theory has been developed, and he kind of, there's tension between when that break occurs at various times. I'm not convinced by the epistemological yeah, it's break. Yes, yeah. questionable. So he, I think, you know, he's trying to attack essentially the philosophical foundations for humanism. And, you know, again, I do think he's a bit unfair, like some... Lukács would be a Marxist humanist who was clearly a revolutionary. Che Guevara called himself a humanist. I don't think anyone here would doubt Che Guevara's revolutionary pretensions. But there is something to be said about how humanism was being used by the French Communist Party and other communist parties. And, you know, as kind of leading away for the class struggle. I think in that sense he's correct in it. Yes? Um, to an ethical kind of simple Question. Sure. One, I just want to uh, make sure I'm conceptualizing it right. The sure. ideological state apparatus is, well, okay, so the state apparatus is the police coming in and breaking up protests 
and the ideological state apparatus, with these examples. Ideological state apparatus is the police coming into your elementary school and your child and telling you to always trust the police, don't do drugs, they're there to help you, and stuff yeah, like that. Is I, that I, think, I think that's actually a good way to put it, because a repressive apparatus also contains an ideological state apparatus. So the way you describe, yeah, dare, don't, yeah. Uh, you know, don't do drugs, and everything, but it also, you know, behind that there is the baton, there is the gun. Okay. You know, and so, you know, because even though, like, some of them are private, like, you know, churches and school, or, well, some schools anyway, um, they, they do reinforce the dominant ideology, and, you know, they're, therefore, you know, he would put them under the rubric of the state. Okay. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask is, what, what is the critique of humanism? I mean, this might be a big question, but, yeah. um, because I, I've heard and read about you know, humanism being critiqued by Marxists, but I can't really, um, I don't know what the is, necessarily. Just that it doesn't focus on I mean, the class struggle? It's partly that, it's partly that it's from a pre-Marx or a pre-Marxist period, before Marx had really developed his theory, and it is, it is not, let's see, where did I see it? It is promoting like the ideology of man, liberty, alienation, which some of this he would cons like, especially alienation is from a pre-Marx period or pre-Marxist period. And his idea, let me be clear, when he's criticizing humanism or an when he's promoting anti-humanism, it's not so much because he hates people. I, I think we misunderstood that. It's because he wants. Because, you know, he's a communist, he wants to abolish capitalism and all that, and have a society where you can have practical humanism. And therefore, by being an anti-humanist, and promoting, you know, a more revolutionary ideology, in his view, which was developed by the mature Marx, you know, sci uh, scientific Marx, socialism, that therefore you can better able to create a practically humanist society. And he thinks that a theoretical humanism ultimately won't lead to revolution. It will, you know, it will lead back into social democracy, revisionism, or what have you. It won't actually abolish the existing relations. Whereas a theoretical anti-humanism will be better able to do that. Yes? I mean, this is, again, mo mostly from more personal experience than actual read, a lot of reading, but, uh, well, in some reading, certainly, but uh, I, I think that there's a, there's kind of a dichotomy between Looking at ideology at a micro, at a macro level, like how does ideology influence society, and then ideology at the individual level, and humanism, at, at least from, uh, I was actually very interested in humanism as a teenager, and I did do, you know, reading back then, and, you know, maybe didn't understand as well as I would now if I went back to look at it, but at least in the United States, I I, I saw humanism as coming out of critique of religion, where. Religion, kind of, a lot of religious teachings are well. Whatever happens, whatever whether it's disasters or miracles, it's part of God's plan. Yeah. And the critique of the humanists kind of coming out of a secular position say, no, we actually have the ability to make decisions ourselves, and this is actually we, human agency. We can actually shape the world around us. And in that sense, it's extremely empowering. It's like the individual can actually do things to make the world better, or at least to make your own life better. But but it's also at the same time very individualistic because it, it also is very much compatible with the capitalist ideology of you know well you know th there may be adversity but if you work hard enough you can compete and and do better and, and pull yourself up by your bootstraps type thing and, and I think there's a lot of that in, in our society today still that we're, you know the idea that you know you can just go out there and, and you know, get the right education or the right, uh, you know, find the right opportunities, make the right investments, whatever it is, and and improve your own life. And it's not just that if you blame the system, somehow you're making excuses, right? Like if you blame capitalism for your oppressions, you're, you know, you're just making excuses for not working hard. And, and I, I think that's, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily, that kind of individualism is, necessarily an essential component of humanism, but it seems like the, the two have been <laughs> largely married. <laughs> I was thinking of a somewhat analogous situation, but from a crew living in a completely different context than the 
early 70s, P.F. Skinner wrote a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which uh, attacked what ideas that he regarded as unscientific, like free will and uh, belief in moral responsibility. And after the, that book got lots of public attention, he, the American Humanist Association decided to give him the, decided to give him the, the Humanist of the Year Award. And that caused a lot of controversy within the organization because a lot of people saw that so it's going to look as contrary to humanist ideas. Precisely because he, he you know, Skinner rejected free will and he rejected the idea, notion of an autonomous man. And that's really somewhat analogous to what people like Alcacer say were doing in France in a totally different political and cultural context. So it was, it was sort of an analogy there, I think. John? Skinner put his daughter into a... Uh, situation uh, for a, a period of years, I guess. Uh, really. yeah, that's, 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 that's sort of a fledging thing. Well, I'm it's, not using the in the psychology profession. I'm just <laughs> saying a deprived situation. No, I'm not very saying daughter would <laughs> but anyway, behave and disagree with that. <laughs> okay, that's a debate. <laughs> but anyway, getting back to humanism, uh, <laughs> There was a humanistic justification for slavery yep. back in the old days, okay? Uh, you know, there's all the talk about freedom, democracy, the, the great American uh, step forward in 1776 and, and so forth. Uh, and, and it couched in very humanistic terms, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and this was built upon a slave economy in the South. Uh, and uh, the humanists would rationalize it by saying that, uh, well, you know, they really aren't human beings after all, and they're, they're beings that have to be tended to by their master, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. I think people are familiar with that. Uh, whereas, you know, the Marxists would approach it as a, uh, a society divided by classes. Uh, that there is definitely a struggle between the slaves and the slaveocracy and the, the lynchings and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it's a humanism based on the reality of the actual society and history and, and its division into classes and the struggles that unfold, which uh, you know, give humanism more of a material basis in the realities of what's actually going on in history. You know, in that sense, Marxism is anti-humanist. Sure. Uh, I'll just leave it there. And of course, at least that's how I see it. Of course, humanitarian interventions. You know, you how many interventions, like currently, are actually justified? Like we want to conquer you, and you know, kill everyone who wears a headscarf or something like that. How many are said like they want to take your oil? It's like no, we want to bring freedom, and democracy, and all this kind of stuff. So you, again, yeah, you're right. Marxism, in that sense, would be anti-humanistic. And of course, you know, I, I don't. Again, I'm not the type who wants to paint all humanists with the same brush. I think again, there have been many great humanists we can learn from, and um, who are, you know, people on our side. After all, there were abolitionists before yeah. Marx. <laughs> They're abolitionists. Well, it seems to me that it's, even despite your your best ideological intentions, I mean, there's always. There's always a tension between what people say and what they actually do, and a lot of it can come out of the class positions of the people who are espousing it. Like, you know, Thomas Jefferson may have honestly believed in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but because of his class position, been you know unwilling to really uh, you know address the contradictions of holding slaves with that kind of ideology. So uh, I'm sure with the, the human, you know, come the humanists, there, you know, the limitations of the philosophy coming out of the nature of the, the people who are, yeah. who are I, writing it. I mean, that's why, like, when he defines class, Althusser defines class. He also not just like their economic position, but it's also political and ideological. So yeah, Thomas Jefferson or whomever can say all this great prose and stuff on, you know, the dignity of man, but his class position is economic, which is determinant in the last instance, essentially, is its dominant in there. And it colors, essentially, the ideology that appears. 
We went to um, a lecture by Chris Hedges last Thursday at the JP Forum. Oh, you went to yeah. it was it was it's really good. He talks about um, some of these um, early, I guess, kind of like some of the early process of developing an understanding of the role of ideology um, by capitalists and how. Like in the, during World War One, the you know the Woodrow administration you know figured out how to turn a, an anti-war populace into you know, supporting World, World War One. You know, it's, it's a nation of immigrants who largely fled European wars to somehow convert people into supporting it, and how we've developed this war propaganda um, into you know being extremely sophisticated now, where it's like you have to support the troops or or whatever, and. Uh, there was somebody in the audience actually asking him, like, how do you break through that? And, and they were he was using the example because there were some several people brought up the, the issue of nuclear weapons, and and Chris Hedges mentions the absurdity of how we're we're spending, you know, we're, over the next ten years we're going to spend like another half trillion dollars on, you know, modernizing the nuclear weapons program and building twelve more nuclear submarines and. You know, you have these people who are like scientists, and that's and you know who are doing the actual people who are actually doing that work to somehow justify this is you know even though like it has nothing to do with fighting terrorism. You know, ISIS doesn't even he wrote one of his essays. ISIS doesn't even own a rowboat, as far as we know. You know, but we're building these nuclear submarines. <laughs> you know, so what's, but there's somehow but ideologically. If you're really, like you're in that system, you're you're getting a, a nice fat paycheck. You're going to figure out ways to justify it and, and defend yourself from any kind of criticism of it. And, and but like those are the people we somehow like to really dismantle the system. That, you know, those are people that I think that was the, the push anyway of the, of the question was how do we get these nuclear scientists to say we're not working on this you know insanely destructive program anymore? And I think. First of all, I didn't go to that, but Hedges has been rather interesting as of late. I think he also just released an essay that Clyde Marx was right, or something to that effect. I haven't actually read it yet. Mm -hmm. So, But it's also like, what well, kind of goes, the observation that Althusser says about how the reproduction of ideology does not take place primarily at the work site, you know, the factory work. It's like why he highlights the role of education, you know, because Obviously, the reproduction of ideology does take place at wherever you work. There's like, how many of those scientists, you know, they haven't, but I probably imagine most of them have not been in a factory. Or they don't, you know, that's not what they spend most of their time. But they've been inoculated, you know, going through education, through their elite universities, through what have you. And all of this, you know, ideology has been put in them. And they're trying to live that practice as they see it. They probably think, we're advancing the cause of mankind, of freedom and democracy. And that's, of course, like why Althusser says, you know, that's why we have to be autonomous from that. We, why the ideological struggle is important. We can't let their views essentially inf infect, it might be too hard a word, but you know, we can't adopt their views. We can't play, we have to have our own autonomous ideology from them. That might be my bastardized approach to that, but, you know. And it, of course, you know, again, as a Marxist Leninist, you would say that's why you need a communist party, you know, involved in the class struggle. And the, again, of course, the class struggle is not just fighting for unions, although it involves that. It also is involved, it's not just doing political work like running in elections or, or whatnot, but of course involves like combating these ideas as well. So it's like an all around struggle is not just fighting for the economic narrowly defined or the political narrowly defined but ideological as well and cultural. Any other comments, concerns, objections on anything? Yes, in the back. Um, if he has information about you know the last speaker are there anyone of the scientists who are interested in development of those destructive weapons? Uh, how come I mean, they are having to get rid of the continuing to do research and development of those weapons? Don't they have some humanity? Because the nuclear war cannot be won. The full scale nuclear war cannot be won. So, how do 
they manage to continue in that profession. Without repeating what others have said, and uh, and most of this talk, they think they are working in the interest of humanity, because that's what they've been educated to do. That's what they've been educated to believe, and they think they're living that. That's what they think they're doing. I mean, from certainly, I think from everyone's position here, they are not working in the interest of humanity. But what do you expect from them? They've gone through schools. They've learned all this patriotism and freedom, democracy that has been indoctrinated or put in, they've been interpolated, as Althus Air would say, into being a subject of, you know, we're a nuclear scientist working to advance the interests of the United States, of freedom, democracy, and the rights of man. That's, and that's why education is so important for Althus Air. It's a very quick two-second uh, summary. So does he propose alternatives to bourgeois education? Would he advocate uh, explicitly Marxist schools? Or? I mean, he looks kind of... How, how do you tackle that? I mean, the university system... Yeah, I mean, that's why he saw, like, the Chinese Cultural Revolution is so important. Because the students were engaged in this ideological struggle in the schools. That's like... And you could see that, in a sense, going on in France, too, because it was the students who kicked off 1968. Yeah. And why, you know, and I do think that's important when how we conceive of class struggle in our political work here, because we've all probably come across at some point in our experience on the left people who just look at industrial workers, and that's not to say that they're unimportant, but to deny the role of students or deny the role of these other groups who can play these pivotal roles in the class struggle. Because the class struggle is, again, not narrowly defined as economic. As for what Althusser concretely proposed, I mean, it's interesting to... I mean, the stuff that he says about China, like how the students were involved in changing things. And that this book on the reproduction of capitalism was written essentially as all the stuff from May 1968 is happening. You can kind of feel it when you read the pages and about how it is important to revolutionize um, those structures. What did that concretely would look like? I mean, let's have the revolution and find out. I can, I'm not quite sure I can answer that. But that's, yes? Do you have any recommendations for good readings in the cultural revolution? I, on the cultural revolution? Yeah. I would check, I mean, if you want like pro-China or pro-cultural revolution stuff, Marx to Mao's got some good stuff. Uh, I would definitely check out Alpha Sarah's essay. And uh, Monthly Review has uh, published some good stuff in the past and the present. And there's all kinds, of course, critiques of it, you know, you know, from bourgeois historians, which can, you know, whatever your opinion, you know, they're worth checking out. But if you want like pro stuff, you know, that's, that's stuff to check out. John, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I mean, then there's the con stuff as well. Yeah, uh, tons of con stuff, yeah. Yeah, but not just bourgeois. No, they of course they're politics. Yeah. They're, they're sure, they're Marxist, Marxist critiques of it too. All through a lot of this. I mean, you look at '68. You're talking what, four years later. Uh, Mao was cutting deals with Richard Nixon to screw the working class. I mean, you know, that was part of his ideology as well. Uh, of the cultural, the cultural revolution can be evaluated in different ways. Is the main point. And there's, oh yeah. There are Marxist critiques uh, which are diametrically opposed to it, as well as Marxist critiques who were looked at it in, in a very favorable light. Uh, you know, for me, I mean, you know, Mao Zedong uh, had long before '68 abandoned uh, any kind of consistent uh, Marxist uh, theoretical framework. That's the way I see it personally, and that it was just more like the ends versus the outs. And it, it, okay, his faction won. Well, what happened years later? I mean, Deng Xiaoping ended up on top precisely because of uh, Mao, Mao's lack, uh, and at times diametrically opposite uh, perspectives against Marxism. 
would allow uh, you know the kind of process that unfolded uh, you know after actually during and after his death. I mean, it didn't start with Deng Xiaoping either. It started with Mao Zedong back before he died. This is this process of the the whole reorganization of the Chinese economy. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that. Folks can. You know, look at the history uh, between 1968 and 1976 when he died, and there, there's you know lots and tons of evidence about uh, what his evolution was like in that period. Oh yeah, I mean I don't mean to dismiss uh, like bourgeois criticism of the Cultural Revolution or even Marxist criticism of it. I mean there's stuff to learn from it. Like uh, one book I actually thought was it was interesting because it was it was like one of the few instances that I could say like this was almost like a pro Cultural Revolution Trotsky's interpretation, Party, Army, and Mass in China by Li Bo Mantin. That was an interesting book. I'm not sure how well it holds up. My opinion of the Cultural Revolution is, you know, it's, I'm probably still developing it at this point. I don't have like a final verdict I can share with you. Um, but there's also tons of stuff here as well. And to go over the vast literature on the Cultural Revolution, but. You know, just read and interpret critically whatever you come across, and just ask people questions. I mean, you kind of get some idea here. Mm -hmm. Ephraim, did you have a question? So, I mean, um, one of the fundamental problems of American society is that the social fabric of American society is, for the most part, anti-socialist and anti-communist. And um, what do you say about that? I mean, what is the level of influence? of uh, the American intelligentsia and the working class movement in America in terms of a socialist revolution in the United States. If this is not the case, I mean, this country is going to go end up as a social, social democratic movement, like Bill of Rights, Socialism, whatever that is. So what, what do you say about it? Is there a level of maturity? Um, among the American intelligentsia and the working class, or left, left wing the working class, to engage in a socialist revolution in America? I'm not even quite sure we can really say we have an intelligentsia the way we would say in France, where people like Al Dusser, like had almost superstar, or same with Sartre, or even Badu, these are like. In France, there really is like an intelligentsia, both historically and probably currently, to a large extent. And it's it's ironic to think about this. Like Noam Chomsky is like probably the most famous quote unquote radical intellectual in the United States. There's a reason why his stuff is more popular abroad, because we really don't have that type of intelligentsia uh, climate. I had a friend who told me this culture is incredible. This society is incredibly philistine. <laughs> So uh, we really, I mean, there are certainly intellectuals in this country, working class and otherwise. And in terms of the left here, I mean, let's face it, you know, in terms of an explicitly socialist, communist, or anarchist left, very small, very fragmented. And that's part of, you know, admittedly our task is to work to build that. And it does, it will certainly will mean breaking with um, bourgeois forms of ideology, winning over people we can, and you know, building our own organizations. Okay, so I I can't exactly answer what is to be done in like uh, this talk. John did a I heard a good job on that. Yeah, I wish you would have come. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, can I make a couple announcements? Please go ahead. I'm holding them here, a couple flyers here. Uh, there is an, a burgeoning and upsurge in a uh, movement that's either labeled. Hands up, don't shoot, or Black Lives Matter. There are mobilizations that are going on around the country. Uh, so, you know, these activities are cropping up. Uh, one of them is going to be this Monday, and it's called Baltimore is Everywhere, and there's a, uh, you know, a panel that's going to be talking about the, uh, from the, from the standpoint of the victims, you know, families, stuff like that, uh, are going to be uh, talking in uh, and at Madison Park High School in Boston, you all can see it on the flyer. So, you know, it's kind of like a discussion like this. 
the person Monica James is a trans activist who was arrested about a hundred times and testified before the UN. Okay, uh, the other one is there's going to be a march and rally on Juneteenth that weekend on the 20th of uh, June. All right, so that's coming up Saturday. What are we talking? Uh, two weeks from now. Yeah. And uh, they're going to be mobilizing. Uh, the main demand is to jail the killer cops and end racist police violence. So uh, folks can participate in that. There are community organizing meetings for that. Uh, you know, here's another uh, organization that's working very closely with families who are going to play a prominent role in, in this march, uh, who've been, uh, you know, victimized by the police. And, and, you know, these particular families are families who've had loved ones who were uh, murdered by the cops. So, uh, you know, there, there's an opportunity to mobilize and, and as part of this as well. And I'll, around as well. Uh, so, you know, J Juneteenth and Baltimore is everywhere. I think on that note, thank you, I we can end this. I, I hope, despite the small crowd, I think we had a very good discussion. I hope you all enjoyed the lecture. And next month will be ground sheet, so that's on July 11th uh, here. So not the first Saturday, just because of the so thank you, and uh, feel free to like us on Facebook, sign up, and everything. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.